I'm delighted to be joined now by John McTernan, Tony Blair's former political secretary. John, thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, with Storm Kathleen raging across half of the country, I'm wondering if there's a storm brewing in the Labour Party, John, because we've got yet another report on the front page of the Mail on Sunday this morning about Angela Rayner's second home. The political editor there, Glenn Owen, claims to have got evidence that she did have this second home and that she was, in fact, living with her husband when she says that she wasn't. So this storm continues, doesn't it, to engulf the deputy prime minister or the wannabe deputy prime minister, I should say, do you think that actually Angela Rayner is becoming a bit too much of a hindrance rather than a help to Keir Starmer? No. And the thing ah. is, absolutely not. She's an absolute asset to um, Keir. Uh, she's part of the reason why Labour are leading in the polls at the moment. She's got like, charisma. She's got the common touch. She uh, is a great campaigner. And the story is a concocted confection, and it's aimed at trying to destabilise one of Labour's greatest campaigners. It's laughable. Hang the, on. The, and the obsession, the obsession uh, of one newspaper with this story is laughable because nobody can actually sum up in a sentence what this scandal is actually meant to be. Well, I'll sum it up in a sentence as far as I can understand it, John, is that she claims to have been living in a home that she wasn't living in, and therefore she may have a capital gains tax implication from selling what was a second home and not a primary home. So the allegation is that she's lied and she's claimed that her second home was her primary home. That's the allegation. No. It's really clear. You say no other newspapers have covered the no, story. You're... Everyone's followed you're... up on the mail on Sunday. She's you're... got questions to answer. You're... If it were the Conservatives, you'd be them. you'd be attacking them for it. She's completely answered them. <clears throat> and the problem you've got, <clears throat> the problem you've got in that explanation is you, you should why it's not a story. Because the tax definition of a primary residence is a technical issue. And that is all that matters. Um, people oh. can't distinguish between the and the, the Mail on Sunday is refusing to distinguish between what the tax law says um, about primary residence. And that's it. And the reason. But isn't there a moral is, question for her to answer if she's know. saying that her her primary residence mm. was in fact her secondary residence mm. and that she was actually living with her mm. husband? Why is she she not coming clean about that, John? We know the, ta the, the, the tax situation is simple. Your primary residence is the residence that you designate as your primary residence. That's in the tax law. It's clear that was her accountant's advice to her. Um, and the, the the argument that the, the Mail on Sunday have is presumably uh, with the HMRC and their, 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 uh, the, the way they allow you to define uh, a house, a home, a building uh, that you own as your primary residence. It's nothing to do okay. with the way you live. It's actually a designation. And that, that that's a simple, straightforward matter. It's a tax matter. Tax is complicated. Nobody thinks Angela Ray has done anything wrong. And the way you've drifted off into saying, oh, it's a moral issue. It's not a moral issue. It's a, it's a case of one right-wing newspaper trying to harass Labour's greatest mm. campaign. OK, Labour's greatest campaigner. So you think that she should remain, should Keir Starmer become Prime Minister, she should remain as deputy? All right, not OK. Just deputy, not just deputy Prime Minister. She should be in charge of um, whatever we're going to call the Department of Tackling Regional Inequality, you know, in charge of housing, in, ta in charge of local government, in charge of planning reform, in charge of getting the economy going again, in charge, basically, of rebuilding Britain. I think I can think of no better person to do that than Angela. I was really interested in a piece you've written for The Spectator talking about how difficult it might be for Starmer to man manage a yeah. massive majority. You're yeah. saying managing 450 MPs is a tall order for any party leader. Yeah. And you've also pointed out that there is still a sort of hard left cabal within the Labour Party. You talk about there being 35 members of the Socialist Campaign Group. So first of all, do you think it is going to be difficult for him to manage a large majority? Um, I think a large majority gives you two things. It gives you a mandate and the ability to push through any legislation you want. And the truth is, the government have taken such power of themselves under the uh, the repatriation of European Union law uh, that ministers don't need to even go to the House of Commons to change most law. Um, and I expect that to happen under a Labour government. But with 450, you can get through what you want. The issue is managing them. And the point I want to make is... 
they will have different interests. This will be a markedly younger Labour Party than at any time. The last time they had a big landslide, a big change in 1945, a lot of the members who came in had been in the army. I mean, Dennis Healy, yeah. uh, people have been experienced in the army. We're going to have young people, young people, a lot of whom will be renters, a young people who, a lot of the future MPs, I expect over 100 MPs, to be Londoners in a sense, having been London politicians, living in London, living in the southeast. That will change the dynamics. The, the other big block is Angela Rayner's block, the Northwest. Um, so she'll yeah. be strengthened by the by, by this 75 MPs in the Northwest, around 100, I reckon, London and the Southeast. These are the big blocks that Labour's going to have. Now, you have to respond to their interests. You also need to give them something to do because there's only 150, 160 jobs the government ever gives out as ministers, as PPSs, as whips. So giving people something to do is going to be really important. But also, isn't the Parliamentary Party inherently going to be more left wing than, say, Blair's administration and his parliamentary party? Peter Hitchens has written today, Starmer's Labour is not moderate or safe. I mean, you have to admit that Starmer is more left wing than Tony Blair ever was, right? Yeah, absolutely. I embrace that fact. Um, Keir Starmer is not a Blairite. Right? Keir Starmer is from the soft left of the Labour Party. Keir Starmer is closer in his personal politics to Ed Miliband than he is to Gordon Brown. And I think that's, um, you know, um, that's to be welcome because our, 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 our modern era, the 21st century, Keir Starmer is going to be prime minister in the second quarter of the 21st century, not in the yeah. 20th century. Big demands, big different demands. I think we do require a lefter, uh, a more red, a more greener, a, you know, a red green government rather than a Blairite government. That's what we need. And how much influence do you think Blair is actually having behind the scenes? Because we know some of the policies that the Institute comes up with, Tony Blair's Institute, then ended up kind of filtering into Labour policy. We know, obviously, that Lord Mandelson is quite close to Starmer. How, how close is Blair to Starmer, John? Well, very close. Uh, anybody who saw them on stage last summer at Tony's, uh, the Institute's um, uh, annual conference, you saw chemistry. You saw that this wasn't the first time they've been speaking to each other. They, they speak to each other a lot, as far as I can gather, in the way they react to each other. And look, Peter, Peter uh, is always going to be an influential uh, political figure in, in the Labour Party because he's a great political strategist. So is Tony. And you'd have to be a crazy Labour Party leader in the modern day to ignore the advice, the counsel, the wisdom uh, of Peter and Tony. Um, but here's his own man. He's changed the Labour Party himself. It wasn't anything to do with any Blairites, the way that the Keir took the Labour Party back from the hard left, the way that he's taken us from our worst election defeats in the 30s to being on the verge of a landslide bigger than Tony's landslide. So look, um, there's, there's a lot of people ask where, where the Keir's ideas come from, mainly from him. But does he take good ideas if, if Tony Blair comes up with them? Of course he does. He takes good ideas uh, if Anthony Albanese in Australia comes up with them or if Joe Biden comes up with them in America. Um, if there are good ideas in politics, you should take them rather than ignore them because of who they come from. I mean, that's good while Biden is still US president. He might struggle to get on with Donald Trump, though, might he, John, very briefly? Yeah, Biden's going to Biden's be the president. Um, Trump is going to lose on the abortion issue. Abortion will trump every other issue in this election.